seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. We've been talking about that every Wednesday night at Bible study for quite some time. And here, Jesus is setting us up to watch these two parties have their moment. He, we're, he's setting us up. If we pay a close attention here, he's giving us two examples, one that we should be like and one that we should reject. And this is the same theme that follows throughout Scripture. The seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, Israel and the Canaanites, God's people and not my people, the sons of God and the sons of Satan. In other words, all those things to say, faithful and faithless. That's really what he's showing us in this text. And so as we see that, anytime Jesus is doing it, and anytime he's saying to us, be like this, not like this, we should listen. (laughs) Because he's saying real plain and real clear exactly what to and not to do. Our faithless lifestyle doesn't even necessarily have to look like like an atheist, right? And it definitely doesn't look like that here. It doesn't look like somebody who's put their foot down and said, I refuse to follow in the Lord's ways. It doesn't look like that at all here. It doesn't have to look like someone who hates God. It doesn't have to look like someone who hates his law. It could be sometimes just religious people that are the faithless ones. And that's the point that Jesus is trying to teach us in this moment. Sometimes the folks who grew up in a church who have the look and feel of religion, they actually have no saving faith at all. And this is the heart of Simon the Pharisee. This is the heart of the Pharisee in this text, and we need to listen. Verse 36, if you just want to, I'm going to walk through parts of this text pretty slowly together with us. So you can follow along with me in your Bibles. We might have it up here. Hey, look at that. We do have it up there. You can do whatever you like, but I'm going to walk through it over some time here. Verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. This Pharisee immediately we can see that he wants Jesus in attendance to his house. But if we read the rest of the text, we can tell that it's not because he has faith in Jesus. He doesn't want Jesus in his house because of his faith, not because he believes in him, but he wants him there for something else. Why? Well, because Jesus can draw a crowd. Do you see? Jesus is this Pharisee's opportunity to throw a party and have the entertainment that can draw a crowd. Jesus is his, is his networking tool. You see, we can see, if you read the rest of the text, remember how Jesus was very explicit, that he, he provided him with no gifts or even basic hospitality that was required in their days. He gave him no place to wash his feet, no oil for his head, no brotherly kiss of hospitality, nothing. He's just using Jesus. And this is, this is a public party, and we can tell that because the harlot comes on the scene later on. The, the woman of the city, the prostitute, the harlot, she shows up. How did she show up? Because it was a public event, because she knew that it was happening. This is a public party. The word has gotten out, or well, maybe rather the Pharisee has let the word out because he knows that Jesus can draw a crowd. And the word has spread so much that the woman, the harlot, the woman of the city, she knows about it and she comes. Now, This reads a little strange to us because whenever we think about our houses, um, we think this woman just showed up in his house. That's not actually how this how this uh, building works out. So the common houses back in the day had mostly open bottom stories. Okay, it was it was think about it more like a like a garden almost. It was like it was like somebody's front porch, and that's where most of the of the fellowship and the time together and the and the socializing actually happened. That's where the meals would happen, things like that. Just about the only thing that they would go into their house to do would be to sleep. Okay, because they would make these big dark rooms in their homes that they would go inside of that was really cool because they lived in the desert, right? And they would keep the sun out and it was made of stone and plaster and all that stuff. And so it kept them very cool at night whenever they were trying to sleep. Or they would even go and sleep on their roofs at time. But the portion of the, the bottom story of these homes was, was open, like a, like a garden courtyard. And so her coming into the party is not so much a surprise because remember, the whole point of this is that it's a sort of public event. Because the Pharisee is networking. He, he's trying to get, get some attention put on himself. And Jesus, Jesus knows that that's what's going on. Because Jesus, the Bible tells us, knows the hearts of men. And he goes anyway. He does this many times. In fact, there's at least three times that is recorded in the Gospels that Jesus went to the house of these Pharisees anyway, even though he knew, because he knew the hearts of men, that their motives weren't pure and they weren't likely going to listen to him. He knew that was true. And he went anyway. And that's because 
Jesus knew that the gospel is to be proclaimed to all, even to those who, whose hearts may be hardened by it. In, in other words, we don't look at people and judge them and say, no, I don't think the gospel is going to work on you. Did you hear me? You don't look at people who come into our church or that you meet in, in work or in life in general and say, no, nah, I, don't, I don't think the gospel is going to work on them. Because Jesus didn't think that. Jesus didn't operate that way. Jesus knew the hearts of men, and he would still go into the homes of the Pharisees. Because if you look at the words in this parable, Jesus confronts this Pharisee directly, even though he knows he's not listening. And he does that for the Pharisees' benefit and for ours. That we would know this is the call of Christ. Now let's talk about this Pharisee's heart for just a moment. One of the common temptations for humans in this world is to try and climb the social ladder. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? The one, one of the, that's very common for us. Like we, we network in order to maybe get some new connections for our careers or, or maybe make some, some new sales or maybe we just want to gain more influence or we want to raise more money or we want to get more clout or we want to get more resources. One of the most common temptations for humans is to live life merely to climb the social ladder, the social strata for our own end. We want to climb the ladder, in other words, we want to climb the ladder so that we can be the center of more people's world. What does that mean? That means that who wants to be God? We want to be God. I want to have influence as far as I can possibly reach for me. Right? In fact, this is typically the way that the social media world in which we live in operates because the, dopamines keep, the dopamine hits keep coming with every like that you get. You know what I'm talking about? I'm, I'm reaching more. More people see me. I am, I am loved. I am, in, I am enjoyed. People like me. We create content for the sake of public acceptance and loved. In fact, there's one famous social media influencer. Uh, do y'all guys know who Mr. Beast is? Of course you do, okay? Yeah, if some of you are like, no, because I don't believe in that nonsense. And I'm like, amen. Hold fast. Hold fast. But he's, he's famous for saying uh, that he did not post a single piece of content until he spent $10,000 learning how the algorithm, uh, 10,000 hours, excuse me, simply learning how the algorithms worked before he put anything on the internet. Because he was, he had one goal which was to reach as many as he possibly could. Ah, yes, I am loved. But the eventual love of the world does what? It always ends, doesn't it? I mean, remember the child actors phase? Remember that? When, when like the little kids became the child actors and they got famous and, and then they kept trying to be child actors well into their 20s and it was real weird and you felt real bad and you were like, someone please help these people. God, please help, right? Remember, the, uh, remember the, the famous celebrities who in the 80s were maybe singers or actors or whatever, and then today they don't know when to turn the plastic surgery switch off, and it's gotten terrifying because they're just trying to buy one more moment in the limelight. This is the disposition of the human heart, and that's exactly what this Pharisee is doing. He is attempting to use Jesus to raise his status. He is attempting to use Jesus to, to get farther in life. And in our culture, which is still a mostly religious culture, I don't think it will be in one generation, but here in St. Landry Parish in Opelousas, we are a mostly religious culture. I would say that. There are certain expectations that are placed upon the church and upon people's general moral behavior that still exists. I don't think it's going to be that way in 10, 15 years. I think it's going to make a hard turn uh, towards atheism, towards the leaving of any type of remnant of faith whatsoever. But this is the driver for us in St. Landry Parish, for many of us behind religion. It, in other words, religion is a means of celebrity, right? Religion is a, is a means of, of networking. The wicked have even, have even monopolized and mobilized many churches, turning them into, into voting machines and daycares for government schools, okay? Like that's, that's happened. That's actually happened, and it's already operating. Many in the Deep South regularly choose the church that will provide them with the most connections and opportunity for vertical mobility, more sales opportunities, more employment options, and the most access to high-powered government officials. In fact, 
The same even applies in reverse. For many today, the church is only a stumbling block. So if you stumble into a church that preaches the Bible, that men are made for far, that, excuse me, excuse me, that, that women are made for far more than just another career, that they're engineered to be life givers and to nurture, that homosexuality isn't just a sin, that the Bible calls it an abomination, that the responsibility of education belongs first to the parents and not to the children. You walk into a church that says that stuff, you can kiss your upward mobility goodbye, my friend. See you later. You say things like that enough, especially in our culture, and it will only cost you. And as a result, you might not get to be a part of the big sexy church in town. Folks might label you as divisive, and you might notice your friends taking a few steps back from you. And as a result, the social pressure starts to weigh. You felt that? The social pressure starts to weigh, and the leaders are pressured to be sure to police their tone and their topics. Praise God, you don't go to a church like that yet. It is the responsibility of the elders and the pastors to make sure that that doesn't happen. But that temptation to be the next megachurch is out there. Don't know what I'm talking about? And pastors and church leaders, they feel that. They feel that. If I say this, things are going to get dicey. If I say this, some folks might hate me. And my people. If I say this, that temptation to be the next megachurch must be fought and must never take hold in the leadership or the people of the church. And that is the responsibility of the elders and the leaders and the pastors to make sure that it doesn't happen. But that's what it works. Inside of our Christian culture today, that's the way that it works. Now, Here we see this Pharisee who's obviously using Jesus. He's trying to get some upward mobility. He's invited him to his party. He's saying, all right, Jesus, come over here and do some tricks and grow my crowd. We'll see what we can do with it from there. But let's take a look at the woman. Look at verse 37. The woman comes in. She brings with her an alabaster flask of ointment. Verse 37, and behold, a woman of the city, that that means prostitute. That's another way of rendering a harlot, prostitute, you know, whatever you want to say it, uh, who was a sinner when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Now, there's a lot of speculation here about the size and the purpose of this ointment exactly, but one thing is certain, that it is very valuable. That's important for you to keep in your brain, okay? Some people say it was a great big jar. Some people say it was a little thing that she wore around her neck, but let's not get tied up in all of that right now. Let's just say one thing that we can tell is this was worth a lot of money. Most likely, an object about like that that held perfume of that quality probably was going to run about a year's salary, okay, in in their particular day. So that would be somewhere between 300 and 400 denarii. Now, the ancient world uh, didn't have um, banks, right? And so if they had money, uh, they would either keep the money in cash form, in coin form, or they would put it into assets, and like this. So this was a type of like, think of it almost like it's a type of savings account, okay? So she's got, she's got her money put away in this object. And so if she, she needs to access it later, she can take it and trade it, or she can sell it and have access to her money. Think, of, think about this. This represents like a savings account. She's been saving away for about a year or so. <clears throat> Verse 38, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, um, this gets confusing too because we're like, he's behind, she's behind him, but his feet are there. How's this working out? Uh, the best way for you to imagine this is they're, they're at a table, right? So imagine like a big circular table kind of sitting there and they're all reclining at table. That doesn't mean they're sitting. That means that they're kind of laying on the ground with their, with their shoulders kind of facing the table, and their, their feet are all away from the table. So they're like reclining at table like that. So think about it like, like a wheel and like spokes coming off of a wheel. That'll kind of help you get the, get the imagery right. So she comes behind Jesus, right? And she, she begins to do all this stuff. She begins to, to, to clean his feet with her tears and with her hair, and she kisses her feet, and then she breaks the jar, and she anoints his feet with oil. Now, immediately, we can get three things from her about who she is and what's going on. First, She's humble because she's messing with this dude's feet. Now, he's already made it clear. Well, we read already in the text. He's going to make it clear in a few verses later that his feet have not been cleaned yet. That's a big deal because we're talking about ancient cities in Jesus's day. 
which means you share the street with what? And what do the animals do on the street? Okay, you get the picture, okay? And the things that they're walking around to cover their feet with are, you know, sandals at best that might cover, I don't know, 70% of their feet. So Jesus' feet and all their feet, nasty. You got that? Okay. And she is willing. She comes in and she sees that there's a need that she can meet, right? His feet haven't been cleaned. I can serve him in this way. And so she's already weeping. Now, okay, let's just picture this for just a second, right? But sometimes whenever we picture this particular story, we picture like the Hallmark movie version of it, where she comes down and she drips one or two tears, and then she wipes it, and his feet are mostly clean already anyway, and then they smile, and it's a, you know, wipe to the center and everything's done. That's not what happens here. How much water do you need to clean somebody's feet? A lot. Which means... This is not one or two tears. This, this woman is ugly crying in front of the room. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, you know how you cry and it's like red hot streaks down the front of your face and you're blotchy everywhere and like, it's a, ma- it's a big demonstration. And she's a, she's a woman of the city. She's a harlot. She's a prostitute, which means she's probably got makeup on her face in some form or another, which means what? Her makeup's everywhere. She's got this, and she's a mess. And she weeps so much over Jesus' feet that it provides the moisture for his feet. Can you just imagine, have you ever heard someone ugly cry quietly? No. This is, this is a scene that's happening in this room. This is a humiliating scene that's happening. And it's awkward for everybody, right? It's not just strange for the woman. And Jesus celebrates what she does. She ugly cries. She's heaving hot streaks down her face. She's pouring her tears onto his feet. She's wiping. She's wiping it literally off with her hair, which means she hot streaks down her face. She's got stuff in her hair now. She's weeping like crazy. She's humble. So humble that she looked down and saw her Lord's feet that they were dirty and said, this is how I can serve. Right here. And she did it. And Jesus didn't stop her, not once. Not once. She's humble. She's broken over her sin, which is why she can weep the way that she's weeped. And she's generous. She offers all of herself and what is most likely her most valuable possession. Essentially, she's giving him everything that she has. She's giving herself away in this moment. That's the point. Do you get it? She's giving everything she has. She's giving herself. She's giving her dignity, her time, her tears, what little bit is left of her reputation, her cleanliness, all of it. She's giving it all away for Jesus. And what's the Pharisee doing? Nothing. He's using Jesus to try and get as much as he possibly can from the situation. Do you see the the, the comparison here? Do, Do you see the contrast that he's trying to give us here, she's giving herself away while Simon the Pharisee is working only to gain. And we'll stop here for just a moment and think through this together because she has the disposition of a servant to her Lord, of a servant to her master, of a servant to her king. All that she has belongs to him. There's no what ifs, there's no fallback plans, there's no options. And our faith drives us to hand it to him in the same way. That's what faith does. Faith says, Jesus, everything that I have is yours. Everything that belongs to me is yours. Nothing is only mine. It drives you to live that way. All that I have is yours. He is our good king and we owe him our loyalty and a servant to their king serves them with joy. And in our serving and in our submission, we bring our joyful giving and our offerings to Him. In other words, in other words, you don't look at your tithes as a burden, right? You don't look at your tithes as a, oh no, what am I doing? We offer Him all of it with joy. We don't look at Sunday services as inconvenient. He's the Lord of every day. Amen? We... we we don't look at anything that he's called us to do as burdensome, as, as, as tedious, because he is our God. And the work that he has given to, for us to do, we do it for him because it's his work and we belong to him. But this is the contrast of the Pharisee who's concerned with what Christ can bring him. You see, he provides no allegiance to Jesus. He's just here to network. He's just here to try and grow himself. He's trying to grow his own personal Pharisee brand. 
He's concerned with what Jesus can do for him with no allegiance because the Pharisee has no faith. Do you get it? Are you starting to see that now? The Pharisee has no faith. The Pharisee's not saved. The Pharisee's not a Christian. You're being shown what it looks like to live that kind of a life. And we should also take a moment to say that those who give themselves away will actually be rewarded. Did y'all hear that? See, the Pharisee is trying to network himself a better life, right? He's trying to get Jesus to come in so that he can have the impressive guy at his house, the guy who will do some magic tricks and draw a crowd so that he can look like he has a, a raised and elevated social status. That's his goal. That's his play here. And he, does, he refuses to offer Jesus any real type of allegiance, any real type of sacrifice because he has no saving faith. But the Bible says that the people who actually do lay down their lives for Jesus are blessed a hundredfold. That's what the Bible teaches us. And everyone who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. If you die, you will be raised. If you lay it down, it will be given back to you more so. But the lies of this world is I can't lay it down because then I won't be able to keep it. Right? We, we, we believe that we can't actually sacrifice for Jesus because if we do, then we lose it forever. Those who refuse to trust Jesus because they want to keep all they have and gain more, those are the ones that lose it. Do you get it? Those who refuse to sacrifice and follow Jesus because they want to hold what's close to them, those are always the ones who lose it. Always. But everything that they are looking for that they're trying to use Jesus to get in their life, he promises he would give it to them if they would just trust him. That's it. We, you can't game Jesus, okay? If you're trying to play the religious game so that you can get the most out of life without actually laying down your life for Jesus, without actually giving yourself completely over to him, you gain nothing. But if you really do give it up, he says you get everything. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, who would, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The faithful are blessed, and this woman has faith. You can tell by what she does. But the faithless, they will always lose it. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22 teaches that the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. You can't game Jesus. You can't. It's all or nothing. There's no lukewarm. It's hot or cold. You're either in or you're out. And if you're here to try and network and climb the vertical ladder, first off, you came to the wrong church. <laughs> the wrong one. Second, it will only end in death for you. Let's move on. Verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who, who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. She is a sinner. Ugh. If he would have known she is a sinner, he would not let her touch him. If, she would have known who, if he would have known who she really was. There are speed bumps to a life of faithfulness. I'm going to say that a couple of different ways because that's important. There are speed bumps to a life of faithfulness. In, in other words, there are intentional hiccups along the way that God sends you as a trial to test and grow your faith. As we saw last week, the Canaanite woman, do you remember? The Canaanite woman, she calls out to Jesus. What does Jesus do the first time she calls out to him? Doesn't even answer. Then she insists, she calls out again, and he says, this is not for you. And she says again, no, wait. And she starts reasoning with him, and, and she won't stop. And eventually, after a back and forth of about three or four times, Jesus says, woman, great is your faith. You see, there are intentional hiccups that Jesus throws in front of the way of his people to test 
and to grow their faith. That's how he works. There are speed bumps to a life of faithfulness. And we see that here with the harlot, with the prostitute. Her, her very presence in the room is bothersome for a lot of people there. This, this guy, the Pharisee who's sitting there is like, obviously this guy is not a prophet because if he knew who she was, he would not let her touch him. If he, if he knew he would not let her touch him. Her very presence in the room is a stumbling block for many people in attendance. And it is the same for Jesus' church today. Do you know, and it always has been, honestly. It, it is the same for Jesus' church today, and it always has been. We will always be a church with sinners in it. That's who Jesus' church is for. We don't look around and say, mm, I don't know about that one. Ooh, I don't know if that one's, I don't know if Jesus is for that one. No, 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 no. That's not how Jesus has ever worked. That's not how, uh, this is the same for his church, and it has always been that way. It was criminals who made up the ancient monasteries. Did you guys know that? Go, go read a little bit about the Irish monasteries. Who went to the Irish monasteries? Criminals. <laughs> They were trying to, to get away. It was sinners that were drawn to Jesus. Jonah got sent to Nineveh, which is one of the most debauched places in the world at the time. And the church in Corinth, go read First and Second Corinthians. They were not great people, but they were God's people. And Paul would not give up on them. Hey, 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 guys, you, you cannot sleep with your family members, okay? You can't do that. Guys, listen, I got to write you another letter about this. Stop. Stop it. Stop it. I feel like, you ever seen that Bob Newhart sketch? I feel like that was Paul writing to Corinth a couple of times. Just please stop it. Please stop. Sinners go to church. Amen? No, y'all don't believe me yet. Sinners go to church. Amen. Because it's sinners that need a Savior. So Christians, in other words, what I'm trying to tell you, Christians, you don't need to be surprised whenever somebody walks in the doors on a Sunday morning and they look a little rough around the edges. Where were you 20 years ago? Where were you 20 years ago? Some of you were steeped in your addiction. Some of you were in literal ditches or hiding in bushes because you were sleeping it off from the night before. Some of you were with your umpteenth sexual partner. Some of you were being sentenced to your prison term. Or serving it still. And now, you're here. Because of Jesus, we don't look at people who walk into Christ church and say, I don't know if you should be here, buddy. I don't, I don't know if this place is for you. Let them come. Jesus' church is for those who look rough around the edges. Jesus' church is for sinners. Jesus invites them and is with them. But one thing that Jesus does very clearly is He does not leave them there. He brings them along. Where were you 20 years ago? And where are you now? Not there. Christians remember what Jesus has done, and they welcome those who would come to look for the same. But Pharisees don't want them to be around. Do you see the difference? The Pharisee doesn't want the, the yucky people to come. But Christians who have been saved and redeemed, come on, brother. Had a bad week? Come to church. Let's go. Now, it's important to realize something here, that both of these people, Simon the Pharisee and the harlot, they already know Jesus, okay? Like this moment in the house is not their first interaction with Jesus. You, need to, you have to have that front loaded in your brain in order to understand what's going on in the rest of the text. Because when, when Simon the Pharisee, he invited Jesus to come to his house, which is, probably means he's seen him a couple of times and heard him do his thing. And he said, hey, Jesus, I got some spots if you want to come hang out at the house tonight. He, he knew him already. And the same thing is true with the harlot. 
They're, they're already familiar with him and with his teachings. He's already preached to them and to the audience that they've been a part of probably several times. They've had, in other words, they've both had plenty of opportunities to repent. One has and one hasn't. Do you see? Because whenever the woman showed up, she showed up already ready to offer her gifts to Jesus. She showed up already with a grateful disposition and a grateful attitude. You see, if you don't get that, you think that she shows up and her actions are what saves her. That's not what's going on. She's heard him before. She knew he was going to be there. She's going out of gratitude for who he is and what he's done. She's showing up after that. One's repented, one hasn't. They both had opportunities to repent, only one of them has. And Jesus, knowing the hearts of men, hears Simon's thoughts and he presses in. And Jesus, this is verse 40, if you want to go ahead and go to verse 40 there in your readings. Jesus answering said to them, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Three of maybe the most terrifying words you would ever say to Jesus in your entire life. Jesus looks at you and says, I got something to tell you. And you say, say it, teacher. Here we go. And then Jesus tells him a parable. Verse 41 through 47. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? This is easy, right? This is easy so far. Simon answered, duh, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, Jesus said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for your feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time that I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, because she loved much. For he who is forgiven little, loves little. Now, the prostitute loves much because she's been forgiven what? Much. And she knows. See, like she's been forgiven, therefore she loves. You're seeing the outpouring literally of her love during this time right now. So she's been forgiven. She knows she's forgiven. She has faith. She loves. But Simon doesn't love at all. That's the point of what Jesus is saying. You didn't give me no oil. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't even give me a hospitality, a kiss of hospitality. You didn't do none of that stuff. You didn't act like you loved me at all. You see, Simon is the object lesson. Do you get it? Okay, so there, let me try and slow this down for us. He who loves much has been forgiven much, right? He who loves little has been forgiven. Okay, we got it. We got those two things. But let me ask you, has Simon demonstrated any love to Jesus at all whatsoever in this text? None. So what is Jesus' object lesson for Simon? It's not that Simon is the guy who loves a little. It's that Simon is not forgiven. That's the object lesson for him. Do you get it? Jesus is in his home saying, you've loved zero. Therefore, you're not forgiven. You're acting like an unforgiven person. All of this, in other words, and here's the big moment. Are you ready? All of this, in other words, means that this this whole occurrence is for Simon's benefit. Jesus went to his house. Jesus had dinner with him. The harlot came in who was already cleansed, okay? And Simon sitting there in his self-righteousness, thinking he's fine, thinking he's assured of, he's a son of Abraham, everything's great. And Jesus has set up this entire illustration through his sovereignty to say to Simon, you think you're forgiven, you're not. Because you don't love. You think you're cleansed, you're not. Simon is the object lesson. Simon has no love for Christ because he is still in his sin. The whole point is to contrast her faith to his faithlessness. Remember, Simon isn't interested in forgiveness. He's interested in growing his personal brand. And Jesus loves him enough to tell him that to his face. That's what just happened. He who loves little loves, who, he who's forgiven little loves little. Simon, you don't love me at all. Draw your own conclusion. Jesus loves him so much that he will not 
let him go. Jesus loves Simon enough to confront his wickedness that he may repent, and he loves us the same. This is why the Bible says hard things to us and requires us to repent and confess our sins, because he loves us enough to tell us that we should. He loves us enough to confront our sin. But pastor, we don't have a physical Jesus to sow hospitality to. What are we supposed to be doing? Well, okay, let me give you just a few things real quick. One, loving Jesus is loving His people, and showing hospitality to His people is showing hospitality to Him. And take it a step farther, showing hospitality to those who cannot repay you is even stronger than that. And when we do it, when we are generous and showing hospitality to those who cannot repay us, please don't turn the cameras on. Please don't talk about it on the internet. What you do, do in secret, right? The This is the exact opposite of this Pharisee. The Pharisee is like, Jesus, come to dinner at my house. He's networking for himself. He's growing his own personal brand, his own personal reputation. And this is the exact opposite of the way our world today works. The big donations that churches and businesses make. But we better put it on Facebook. Hold on, get the picture, get the cameras out. We got to talk about this. We got to roll this. Make sure, is it on? Okay, I'm going to start saying my speech now when I hand you the check. Matthew chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, Jesus teaches us plainly that our generosity, our giving should be in secret because he knows that we're all tempted to be like this Pharisee. Look at how good I am. Look at what I've done. Look at how generous I've been. So, who are you? Who are you in this story? Are you the Pharisee? Are you the faithless? Or are you the prostitute? Are you the faithful? Who are you? And I think if you're reading this story rightly, you're saying, uh, I think I might be both. Right? I think I see a little bit of me over here, and I see a little bit of me over here. But let me ask it a different way. Are you in sin? Are you, do you see your sin, and do you refuse to repent of it? Let me ask it, let me ask it that way instead. Maybe you've got unconfessed sin in your marriage. Maybe you've got unconfessed sin with your children. Maybe you've been stealing from your employer. Maybe you've stopped pursuing the basic spiritual disciplines. Maybe your Bible has gotten dusty. Maybe your prayer life is non-existent. Maybe you've stopped gathering with God's people faithfully because it's just not important to you anymore. Maybe you've got unrepented sexual sin. Maybe you've been disrespectful and lying to your parents or to your spouse. I have good news for you. Just like this Pharisee, Jesus will not leave you without a witness. And he's here to tell you, stop it. Repent. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will forgive you. He will. There is no one that is too far gone. We we have all fallen short of the glory of God, and we as his people can walk in his joyful forgiveness if we just trust him and obey and repent and confess. Jesus by his power, is going to love you the same way that he loves Simon the Pharisee. He's not going to leave you without confronting you. So repent and believe. Confess your sins. Jesus loves us enough to tell us we must proclaim and receive it, even if it means that we don't get to be, I don't know, the cool church. So what, bruh? And with the call to repent, we hear a call to life. But for those who are slipping away to death, now this is the last point of this particular story, with the call to repent, it's a call to life, right? It's a call away from death and to life. It's a call away from from dying in a a death of eternity to to living a life of eternity that God has given you. That's what the call to repent is. And we're going to see it in verse 48 through 50. Look there with me. Let's finish this thing off together. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him, okay, you remember this? They're all sitting around a table. They're relatively close to each other. They begin to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? It's a stench to them. He sees, they see Jesus' forgiveness of this other person. It's a stench to the rest of the people at the table. The the words of life bother them. Who is this who can forgive sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, remember what he said to her earlier, though? Do you remember the the thing that he said about her? Whenever he's describing her to Simon the Pharisee, he says, her sins, what? Which are many. 
That's a humbling statement right there to come from the Lord of the universe, isn't it? He's talking about you to somebody else in the room, and you're right there. Listen, there are sins, which there's a lot of them. They're forgiven. Whew. That'll, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> That'll, that'll humble you very quickly. Her sins, which are many. He's clear. He's not sugarcoating. He's not softening. He's being direct, just like he was with Simon. And it's directness out of love. The severity of her sin is on public display. She is an illustration here. And she is made out from the beginning to be the debtor who owes a lot, right? She's the debtor who owes 10 times as much as anybody else. But you know what's profound about her disposition towards Jesus after Jesus does that? She doesn't care. <laughs> she, she doesn't care. She doesn't leave. She doesn't change. She's like, you're right. You're right. That's, that's true. Lot, lot, I got a lot of them. I got a lot of sins. That's true. She knows what's true. And she knows who her God is. It's the same vibe as whenever Jesus confronts his disciples and says, are you going to leave too? What do his disciples say in response? Where else would we go? We got nowhere else. We're here. She loves him and she is not going to leave. She loves much because she's been forgiven much. And then Jesus provides her assurance of forgiveness. Forgiveness that's already happened. This is important too. Okay? It's forg- he, he assures her publicly in front of everyone, your sins are forgiven, even though she's already been forgiven by her act of faith. Do you see what I'm saying here? He still provides her with that compassionate, no, you are forgiven. This is, this is why after we have the, the corporate confession of sins here at church, we do the assurance of pardon. Because you're forgiven if you confess. But it's important that we be reminded. You ever confess your sins and you don't feel any different on the other side? You know what I'm talking about? I've confessed my sins to the Lord, but God, my conscience, it's just heavy on me. I confess my sins to the people that I've sinned against, but God, my conscience, it's just heavy. I can't get past it. Jesus knows. This woman walks in, she weeps because she knew, she knew who she was, and she weeps because she knows she's been forgiven, but it's still heavy on her conscience, and Jesus looks her in the eye and says, you're forgiven. It's done. It's okay. The assurance of pardon is an incredibly important piece for us to continue to hold fast to and celebrate. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. If you've confessed and repented, the Lord has cleansed you. Be free and respond with joy. But to doubt that, to doubt that, is to act like the Pharisee. Who is this that even forgives sins? You see the difference that you're getting in that context? One's pharisaical, one is one who would follow Jesus. Jesus can't forgive those people. Yes, he can, and he does. He forgives you. Even if you're doubting it for yourself, you're doubting Jesus. (sighs) Christians are forgiven. Christians are cleansed people. And that means that we go to church with folks who have pasts. Amen? That's a welcome to Christ Church. Sinners come to this church and they are welcome. We are welcome, I should say. <laughs> we are welcome. And to believe that it isn't possible for these sins to be forgiven is to be this Pharisee. You don't want to be him. The story ends with him being outside of God's grace and the woman being inside of it. You don't want to be him. But I do have good news for you. If that is you, if you are the Pharisee that looks at all the other folks in church in a haughty way, or if you are the harlot, the prostitute, whose sins are many, Jesus says to both of you, all the same, repent and believe. Repent and believe. Confess your sins, and you will receive His forgiveness. And then we unite together as God's people to serve our good King. If you confess your sins, He who is faithful and just will forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Confess and you are forgiven. If you're sitting in here right now and you're saying, I am that Pharisee, then confess and don't let your story in the same way that Simon's ended. If you're sitting in this room right now and you're saying, but I am that harlot, then confess and receive with joy the forgiveness that she received. Confess and you aren't forgiven. You can be clean, Pharisee. You can be clean, harlot. You can be clean. You can be clean, porn addict. You can be clean. You can be clean, 
drug addict. You can be clean. So do it. Confess, be free, be clean, and be united to Christ and to His people. I assure you, you are in good company here. Let's pray.